Hello everyone. So today we'll be discussing a very interesting topic, which is the Turkish Citizenship by Investment Program. We'll be discussing it with Brian, who is very active in the investment migration space, as well as with Keith, who is a real estate agent here in Istanbul and in Izmir, who helps people find good properties for their Turkish citizenship applications. So I'd like to give, first of all, a little overview of the program. It's very simple. You either invest $400,000 in any Turkish real estate in the country. It can be a combination of a few properties, or you deposit $500,000 in a Turkish bank for three years. So most people tend to go for the real estate option because they feel that it's a lot safer than putting than depositing their money in a bank for three years. There is, I feel that there are a lot of misconceptions in the Western world with regards to this program. No one really ever mentions it. People always discuss all the Caribbean options, etc. But whenever you say Turkey, people just run away. Um, I, so I think this, this video will be a bit more of a reality check in terms of what this program truly is, um, who it serves, and also the type of Westerners that come and, and get Turkish citizenship because it's quite niche. So, Brian, you've been living here in Turkey for a long time. You're very close to everything happening with this program. What's your overall view in terms of the market? Who are the people that are actually buying Turkish citizenship? Yeah, it's a great question. So historically, this this country in general, and particularly the early part of this program, has always attracted regional investors, particularly from Arab countries, from Iran, Uh, more and more from Russia and CIS countries and basically the greater region around Turkey. But what has happened, especially after COVID, a lot of people realize that they want to diversify their strategy. They, they are really attracted to the real estate options here. They see Turkey as a country they could actually live in or live part time in. They maybe travel here uh, as, you know, as they're flying through around the world. And they see that Turkey be can become a really useful part of their overall strategy. So whether it's lifestyle and tourism, whether it's actually using the passport, um, a lot of Westerners don't realize that the Turkish passport has a lot of sweet spots. Um, it originally was, uh, especially when the, the, the program actually truly launched, which in my view was the day that it was lowered to 250,000. It's now 400,000, as you've mentioned. It started off as a million, was only attracting a very niche type of usually richer Arab client. When it went to 250, it became a really good deal and it became very popular in a lot of uh, a lot of investment circles and really what people saw it as is this is you know this is a, a country that I could actually spend time in rather than for example Caribbean passports where it's small islands most people don't really trust the quality of nationality there long term and there, people have had issues with those passports trying to travel the world so originally people wrote it off as well it doesn't have european access it doesn't have access to the uk doesn't have access to the us or or you know australia these types of countries so why would anybody want the passport but when you look more closely you see that the turkish passport is Uh, pretty much almost as strong as a European one, minus the Schengen area and access to the US. It's also a great passport generally for uh, even getting visas on if you want to, you know, just go to Europe as a Turk. It's much easier than from a lot of source countries. So there are many use cases for it. There are also countries in the Middle East and around Asia that actually only Turkish citizens get and other countries don't. So it's both useful as a travel document. It's useful as a country to actually live in and stay in. There's a lot of options for real estate, a lot of options for banking. There's so many w reasons why somebody would want this. And I think people don't give it the proper analysis sometimes because they're just so focused on the legacy you know, programs and the European visas and so forth. Yeah, I, th I think you raise a very important point about the, the durability of the citizenship yes. in the sense that many of these Caribbean options have very strong restrictions in terms of who you can add down the line in terms of the citizenship. So if you have children, boom, big fees to add your children. Yep. Grandchildren, same thing, fees. Some of them, it just stops at grandchildren. Then, you know, if you don't, if your future grandchildren don't have their children in that island, then the citizenship just essentially cancels itself for the, for the next generation. When you buy a Turkish citizen, it's a generational play. This, it's essentially people need to see it as an Ottoman citizenship that just 
descends down the generations, whether people are born in Turkey or not. So by making, by buying a Turkish passport now, by making these investments in Turkey, you are giving Turkish citizenship to, if they want, if they choose to, essentially many generations of your descendants. And one other thing people forget is that Turkey is a major middle power. It's a uh, top 20 country by total GDP. Uh, it will be, you know, one of the most important players in the development of this region that has immense soft power across all across Central Asia. It has an excellent military. It has domestic manufacturing. It has uh, great positioning for logistics. It's been a, it's been a major, um, fun, you know, one of the countries that's keeping the world system functioning in the wake of the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So this is a real country that people can become a citizen of. It's the only program of its kind that is a, a, such a large country that you can really make your own in your own way. And uh, people forget that, you know, that type of stuff matters. It's not just about visa-free and it's not just about cost and investment. It's also diversifying your, your sovereign risk. And I think Turkey is an excellent addition for, for that reason. And it, has, and it has embassies and consulates all over the world, yes. um, like most African countries, for example. So even like very remote places have Turkish diplomatic representation, which is interesting, you know, uh, very interesting, more so than many of, than many European passports out there. So Keith, you have been helping a lot of people obtain citizenship here in Turkey through the purchase of real estate in Istanbul and Izmir. So you have clients from a bit everywhere. Um, you seem to have more Western clients on average. So what can you tell us about typically the why are these Western clients of yours obtaining Turkish citizenship? What are their motivations? Because it's, it's quite niche. I think, Brian, of 100 people who get Turkish citizenship this way, how many are Western versus Iranian, Palestinian, Iraqi, Russian, Chinese? Numerically, it's a negligible amount, but that doesn't change the fact that because it's the most popular citizenship program in history, which a lot of people also don't realize, the yes. best-selling program of all programs that have ever existed, and it's only really been around less than 10 years if you really look at it, it's still a lot in absolute terms. So yeah. there's plenty of reasons for Westerners to choose it. Yeah, uh, I think most of the Western clients are really looking at it as a plan B option, uh, maybe something that they'll never need to exercise or that they will exercise. But they're saying, hey, I can come in, I can use my brain, uh, buy some decent real estate, hopefully make decent profit, and in, in the time being also pick up a passport. So uh, yeah, that's for, for most of the Western clients, that's the angle. For clients from the Arab region, maybe it's different. Maybe they view it as a, as a real option for future living, uh, a, a real backup plan, one that they might utilize or they they're might even be utilizing as soon as they get the citizenship. So different kind of uh, approach for both, but uh, both seem quite motivated when they've made the decision to go ahead. Then it's just like, okay, let's find some good real estate and then we're off to the races. Yeah. So amongst your Western clientele, Keith, let's say you have 10 Westerners getting the citizenship. How many are North American versus European? Uh, just by probably due to YouTube videos and things like that, most of my clients tend to be uh, uh, North American or American and less Europeans, but definitely I have a lot of Iranian clients, a lot of Arab clients, a lot of Pakistani clients, you name it, from the, the, the greater sort of region here, all the surrounding uh, countries. Probably have more uh, clients from the surrounding countries than I do from the Americas, of course, yeah. But uh, Europeans would comprise a, a much smaller uh, percentage. And I think this is also interesting, the the difference between Europeans and Americans, um, their views of the Turkish CBI, I find that Americans are a lot more keen to go for it, but often they don't quite understand what they're you know, getting themselves into. Um, so they come here with a lot of misconceptions. They think freedom, plan B. And then they think that it means that they they can come here and be loud and have loud opinions, et cetera. 
they they need to understand that you know when you become a citizen of, of Turkey, especially as a minority, it's not your role to be loud and to have strong opinions and to tell Turks what they should be doing. Uh, when you obtain citizenship here, it's fine. You'll be respected. You'll have no issues whatsoever. But people need to know their place, and this is sometimes an issue that North Americans who come here with the Plan B mentality face because their definition of, of plan B means being loud. But having a good plan B isn't necessarily the same as being loud. Um, and sometimes people don't understand this. So I think that's a cultural shock that sometimes North Americans have when they get their citizenship and they start dealing with the government, with administration, or just with people in general. So I think people need to, just to manage their expectations and understand a bit more of the, the culture and the dynamics in the country and just try to be a bit more respectful. At the end of the day, you're new. Um, sure, you're Turkish, but you, you, know, you bought the passport. You don't even speak the language. Just show a bit of respect. Um, Europeans, it's the other way around. You, speak, you say Turkey to Europeans and they think uh, kebab shop or this or that. It's immediately negative. Um, <clears throat> Or they just think of, you know, vacation in Antalya. So Europeans, even though they're a lot closer to Turkey, have an extremely distorted view of what Turkey is. They think it's still a complete backwater, that it's extremely poor, that it's not developed, etc. But when you drive around Turkey, and I've driven all over the whole country, like the, the, the highways are all brand new, the hospitals are amazing, The, the universities, everything. Like the infrastructure in Turkey is absolutely amazing. It's not a backwater. So unfortunately, a lot of Europeans don't go ahead with this program because of their own prejudice, right? And then Europeans will rather buy a Caribbean citizenship, which fundamentally doesn't really add as much value as a Turkish passport to their diversification plans. I would tend to break down Europeans into a few different segments. So one, Scandinavians, they're never interested in citizenship by investments. You know, they're, they think everything's fine there. Um, then you have Germans, Dutch, they're interested, but they live in fear of their government, their restrictions in terms of dual citizenship. They don't want to get Turkish citizenship here and not declare it, though there's not a lot of information sharing. So they really live in, in fear of their own government. So typically they don't really go ahead with it. Uh, then you have the French who are surprisingly open to Turkey, though French foreign policy is often very anti-Turkey. But you have a lot of French people getting citizenship here in, in Turkey. Um, generally, they are the most aware of what they're getting themselves into, and they're the, the most keen of Europeans to go ahead with this program, and they understand the geopolitical hedge that comes with a Turkish passport, and they understand the cultural implications of and and personal implications of getting Turkish citizenship. Southern Europeans generally don't really think of getting second passports. Um, they either quite don't have the money or they're not that interested. And then you have Eastern Europeans, so Russians, completely different scenario. They want a Turkish passport because it gives them access to banking, to everything, they can travel again, blah, blah. So for them, it makes complete sense. And then you have the odd the odd person from the, the Balkan who somehow, for whatever reason, wants a, an Ottoman passport. So Europeans, you can really segment them into to different kind of boxes. It's quite interesting to see. But again, in terms of Westerners, it's mostly North Americans um, that go for it. Actually, even UK, Irish, they don't typically go for it, um, especially British people. They never really quite see the point of a a second passport unless if it's like Irish or EU. So one of the points that I think is really important here is that going back to what you said, you know, you're coming into a culture, you're coming into a new part of the world, if, especially if you're from the Americas. You know, Turkey doesn't really exist in the in the collective conscious of, of North America. It does in Europe. There's a certain stereotype. There's a certain thought of what Turkey is. There's an encounter with Turkish culture in a lot of European major cities. But with America, I think it's a really interesting client base. And if you're an American watching this or you're researching this stuff, you've maybe been more focused on Latin America, which tends to be the product that's offered. Start to think about how Turkey could allow you to have the old world, the Eurasian continent, kind of 
in your back pocket a little bit. This is a country that actually has a lot to work with. You have people to meet, you have business opportunities, you, you can acquire property very easily here. I mean, in some ways I would agree that you have to be you know, a little quieter and it, you know, this is a Muslim country. This is a country that has its own history and its own language. One of the best things I think that's kept Turkey intact is its language and the fact that it isn't a country that is just immediately steamrolled by an Anglo-American discourse. I mean, you look at all over, all over the Gulf, it's essentially American and British corporations and, and different companies that have come in and that's changing now. And of course the foreign policy is changing, but Turkey is a civilization unto itself. This is a civilizational passport. This is not just a state or a particular government that's you know, maybe issuing citizenships because they wanted to raise money or something. I see it as a very long-term and big picture option for people where they can say, all right, well, I am part of this part of the world and I'm also able to access new and maybe a new and better type of lifestyle. It's, I mean, not to be underrated that you can live very well here if you're bringing in foreign currency. That's kind of old news. People know they can get great hospitality. They know they can pick up a nice property at significantly less, uh, for significantly less money than they would elsewhere. And so I think as much as people should be a little bit aware and do their research and, you know, step outside of the main areas of Istanbul. We often talk about, you know, Istanbul is Istanbul. It's a city state. It's very cosmopolitan. But Turkey is still, by and large, a middle development, middle market Muslim country. And there's a lot of benefits to that, especially because, in, you know, in my personal opinion, a lot of the things people are fleeing from in the West, the reason they're fleeing is because that society doesn't work anymore in some ways. And so Turkey has an alternative option and they do things a little differently here and that's part of the appeal actually people try to turn it into a you know a, an aspirationally european country it's not this is its own civilization and people also can find solace in the fact that it's a deeply pro foreigner and very much a melting pot culture i've never felt ostracized here i've never felt like i've had any difficulty doing the things i want to do i'm treated generally very well by the turkish people because i express curiosity in the culture i've learned some of the language and so, you know, see it as a place to become part of. And it is a, it's not a culture where you will forever be seen as a total outsider. Of course, it's hard to say if you can ever really become another culture that you weren't born as, but Turkey's a pretty close option. I mean, you're never going to truly become Japanese. You're never going to truly become Malaysian or, uh, or Nigerian, but you can become Turkish. And it's a very uh, unique moment in time in this industry and I don't think it'll last forever, this program. It's you know, constantly discussed, is it gonna close? I think we've bought some time with the recent election result in terms of the program staying open. I don't know if you feel the same way, but this, this is the moment to, be, to plant a flag in this part of the world. I, I, I agree with um, everything you said there, Brian. I'd just like to add a few things. Uh, I had lived in several other countries throughout the world before coming here. And, uh, you know, ultimately in, in those countries, you get into a kind of expat bubble. Yeah. And I really didn't like that. I, I didn't want to be far from Europe, uh, but I still wanted to be abroad. So I chose Turkey. And as soon as I got here, I realized there's no need to be in an expat bubble. You can immediately discard all those kind of internations groups or all those ha hash house harriers. I don't know that you have in the Middle East these weird groups of expats that get together on Fridays and do whatever they do. Right. I never did that. I've been to like one or two meetings like that. Never felt the need. Never really felt like a foreigner. Okay, obviously I am, and sometimes it's obvious. Uh, but generally, I never felt like that. And yeah. that was really important to me. I just want to go about my day, go about my business, not stick out and, and not need to go... Uh, you know, necessarily meeting up with expat. I have lots of expat friends, but we, I don't go to expat clubs or right. uh, join activities uh, to go hiking with expats or anything like that. I don't feel the need to. And one more thing, which I think you touched on, but which is really important to me, when I, when I go to other countries, this is really standing out and really bothering me. The service culture is so ingrained here yes. and it's such a high level especially in Istanbul, you can get anything. Sunday night, your girlfriend kicks you out of the house, you need a moving van, it's uh, two o'clock at night, somebody will find it for you. Absolutely. <laughs> or some dude will come along with a, you know, <laughs> something over his back and move your stuff. So, and, and Are you speaking from experience? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of such people, but... <laughs> but no, that's true. Uh, but, but also, uh, there's the, the service in, in restaurants. And when I, you know, I went to Georgia, everybody was talking about Georgia, and I'm like, what's this Georgia thing? I go into a restaurant, 
restaurant in Georgia. It's embarrassing. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry if you're Georgian, but I really, and, and, and that's the case in most places. I, I went to Hungary, you name it. it. Greece, okay, is a little bit better. Sure. But so many countries, African countries, I'm sorry, like the service in restaurants, et cetera. Uh, Dubai, somewhere like that is obviously very good, but I would put it on that level. Yes. And that that's really nice when you're living here. You can get whatever you want, whenever you want, and people are happy to bring it to you. They're, they've got a smile on their face, no matter who you are. As long as you smile back, you generally don't have any problems. I agree. I think that this program is, for anyone who is serious about internationalization, is the best out there by far. Um, in a world where the, the power seems to be shifting from west to east, Turkey is uniquely placed to take advantage of this shift, and it is operating this shift as we are talking. It was historically very pro-West, and increasingly it's becoming pro-East. It's going to be a volatile and messy transition because obviously it will come under attack from various angles. So Turkey will be making the headlines over the coming decades, often for negative reasons, but it's forging its path ahead very clearly. And by buying this, by investing in this passport, you get to have a stake in this, like you say, civilization that is going into a different direction, especially as a Westerner. So you'll be able to jump between West and East. And I think in a world that is increasingly bifurcating between the two sides, having this passport is a unique tool to have for you, for your family, and for your descendants. But just people need to understand that it, it will be volatile. Um, when, you know, Turkey is at the heart of everything. It's, it's right in between West and East, and it's operating a, a whole shift in foreign policy in the economy as well, increasingly going East, etc. So it will not be an easy transition. Ultimately, it's the right decision for the country, and you as an investor in the Citizenship by Investment Program here in Turkey will benefit in the long run. Well, and, and also, I mean, there's a couple ways to assess the quality of, the pro of, of a, any type of citizenship opportunity or any investment opportunity. What's nice about Turkey is it's, it's good actually on all fronts. It's A, a great country itself, which is kind of the most important one in my opinion. It's B, a great travel document if you are again willing to take off the Schengen obsessed glasses that everybody has in this industry. You can see how it would be a useful travel document for a lot of things. And it's also a great program itself. The program is structured in a pro-business, pro-investor, pro-customer angle. It's a low hassle KYC process. Generally speaking, it's a low, uh, it, it's a very quick processing time relative to current industry standard. None of this, I mean, of course there's backlogs because of the demand, but none of this two, three year closures we hear about in the, in the West, none of these, you know, endless uh, proof of everything, you know, what's your tennis teacher's names, you know, it, ridiculous things that they ask in certain European programs. So the program itself, if you're looking purely just at the experience of making an investment, you know, generally is, I think, the best structured, even if the country wasn't good, it would still be a good program. And so you have it on all fronts that it's a, 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 a pretty much a good option. It, it isn't for everyone, but for anybody who decides to do it, I can see a use case in almost any example. Um, and the other thing about Turkey is, you know, this is because it's a larger country. Yes, it's volatile and yes, expect to see the headlines, but that's part of freedom. Part of freedom is being somewhere that's actually making a stand for some type of future. And I think there's an um, immense soft freedom that's not discussed. And I just recommend for anybody who's curious about it, don't have an opinion about the Turkish program unless you've been here. Yeah, very and unless point. you've spent at least a few weeks, because it's funny, the, the people who have the biggest negative opinions about Turkey, it's not the kind of country you can analyze from afar. It's not the kind of country you can analyze from headlines. I, start, I don't think that about it, pretty much any country. I would recommend seeing things for yourself generally, but specifically to Turkey, there are many historical institutions that are 
very vested in Turkey not pursuing its own independent foreign policy. You see that in the, the Western media. You see that in the, you know, the European Union, the way that the U.S. talks about Turkey as this kind of legacy you know, partner in the Middle East. That's not how Turks see their destiny. That's not how the, the government, the current incum- government sees their position in the world. So come and see it. Don't listen to all the, you know, people, oh, the Turkish economy is going to collapse and the people, you know, this is a very functioning country in a lot of ways. It has a lot of problems. It also has a lot of great things going for it. And I just really encourage people before you make any sweeping statements about it, spend a little time and dig around and see what there is here. Yeah, it's just going to be a volatile ride. And I think what people, what Westerners need to understand as well is I, I travel a lot around the world. We are increasingly despised as Westerners with our Western passports. Um, We have had a very aggressive foreign policy for a few centuries now. Um, Our aggressive foreign policy is increasingly out of sync with our actual power as power is shifting east. So, you know, when we were arrogant and powerful, that was one thing. Right. Increasingly, we are arrogant and ever more neutered. So that's not a good mix with people having a, a bad aftertaste of what we've done to them over the past centuries. So having a Turkish passport and going around Africa is much better than going around Africa with a UK or a French passport. I can guarantee you this. You will be more welcome as a Turk when you're doing business when you're trying to push paper, paperwork through the government administrations, et cetera, and they see a Turkish file, a Turkish passport copy coming through for whatever investment, for whatever visa or whatever, than a French or a UK passport. So sure, the French and the UK passports are still doing well there because of the fear factor, but as the fear diminishes, um, it's increasingly going to be a problem to have the, the passports of the, the former colonizers. So if you really think long term, again, you want a Turkish passport to do business in developing countries. And if you think that you, the, the UK embassy or the Canadian embassy is going to have your back when you're doing business in Venezuela or something goes wrong in Argentina or in Burkina Faso, uh, that's not going to happen. They, they never help independent businessmen. If you're a big corporation, sure. If you're just a guy trying to do business, the Canadian embassy, the U.S. embassy will not do anything for you. Um, So you're better off being with a Turkish passport where at least people don't hate you. And who's the first that always sends the plane and always sends the volunteer aid every time there's a natural disaster, every time that when the Ukraine-Russia thing broke out, who was sending a, a diplomatic envoy for their citizens? Turkey was. Where, where in Africa, like you said, is there the most presence of consular missions? Uh, it's consistently Turkey. Access to, you know, I mean, th- this is something that people don't think about when, when times are good. But we learned during COVID that the government responsible for you does matter. It affects your day-to-day life. It affects your perception when, you're travel, when you travel. And if you're a permanent expat and you're banking on a country that you don't even really live in anymore that could be very far away being your only calling card, I would be I would be concerned about it, and if, if you know if the if the option is even there, I mean I think maybe you could even just touch on just what how much you can get for the money. I'm sure you've covered that in other videos, but you know we're not even talking here. Oh, let's make this big investment that goes down the drain, and this is some you know philosophical long term play. I would still think it was good even if that was it. But it's also that you're getting a couple of great properties along the way too. Yeah. I mean, let's not forget that it has to be practical in the now. You're getting all of that long term. And you're also getting two apartments and a beach home that yeah. you can sell in three years. It's like, I literally can't see any reason why anyone would do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, for example, let's say my name is Jonathan. I'm from, I don't know, Philadelphia or Chicago. I want to get citizenship here in um, Turkey for myself and my family. What sort of property mix slash investments would you just recommend top line. Like, what, what, do you, what are you currently selling to people, helping people invest in? Yeah, normally what we're doing these days still is suggesting perhaps a stack of properties, one in Istanbul, because 
80% of our clients definitely want something in Istanbul. And then we're making some kind of uh, alternative offers, usually in Izmir, but perhaps Kojeli, some of these emerging cities that are, uh, you know, kind of uh, satellite cities, not, not too far from Istanbul. They're really doing pretty well, actually, post-earthquake as well. There's a kind of exodus to some of these locations. So we really look hard at those now. Uh, if it's in Istanbul, we try to stay central, but every now and then, if there's a special opportunity, we're willing to go into some of the suburbs, but we prefer, of course, to be uh, reasonably central. We don't want it to take an hour and a half to, to get to Istanbul and still be claiming that we're selling a property in Istanbul. No, if we're saying we're selling a property in Istanbul, we want to be able to get downtown easily in 20 minutes, 30 minutes maximum. So yeah, we're, we're focused on that kind of core, but that comprises about six different, seven different municipalities that we regularly look for properties. Fati, Katani, Shishli, Beshiktas, Beolu, uh, on the Asian side, Katikoy, uh, even Maltepe sometimes. So lots of different neighborhoods that we look at and we're open to, but yeah, of course we're doing probably most of our sales in the kind of core downtown Istanbul area. We're fairly happy with that. Uh, and yeah, prices have gone up in the last couple of years. You know, three years ago, I was screaming it from the rooftop, just buy anything, buy it right now. Yeah. Not buy anything, but it, yeah. you know, start buying. It, it's, it is, you know, I'm bullish and I wasn't like that for many years in the late 2018, it's 2017, 16, those kind of years. Around 2019, I just said, people should be buying. This yeah. market is undervalued. It is a classic undervalued uh, market on every metric. And then, of course, it did start to go up in yes. 20, 21, still lots of good deals. Now we're in 23. It's more selective. We have to be more careful. There's a lot of properties that are overpriced or we just don't see much future in those properties. But selectively, we're closing deals, not as many as we'd like because, you know, there's a, a difficulty sourcing these properties. But still, we are able to find several every month. and. Hopefully we can work through the details to close on some of those. That's where we're at with the market. Uh, our typical thing is we try to, uh, we're going to look at a property today where we just come in. These days, the yields are a bit uncertain. Let's say that. So we're having a hard time with the math because of the Turkish Lira. So it's really important when we look at a property, we want to get something that we feel is like 10, 15 percent at least uh, off the current market price, kind of lock in some gain, some paper gain, and then it eases the pressure on the yield somewhat. So that's really our strategy. Go in, try to find those properties that are just, you know, under uh, under market price a little bit, and we're off to the races. We're happy then. We do a lot of renovations still, but these days probably a little bit less for a lot of different reasons. We're looking at some newer properties downtown, but that's still one of our, one of our places. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you, Keith. So if you're interested in travel information as well as perspective on the industry and a lot of thought-provoking ideas as well, feel free to follow Brian. There's his Instagram here as well as his LinkedIn. And if you're interested in obtaining the Turkish citizenship by investment, by buying real estate here in Turkey, make sure to get in touch with Keith. There's a link below with more information on his services as well as his email. Yeah. Or just real estate in general. <laughs> it doesn't have to be for the CBI, of course. Cool. Yeah. Or real estate in general. True, true, true. Cool. Thank Gentlemen, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can go to my website, thewanderinginvestor.com, and sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. This way, you will be getting insider information as I travel around the world looking for opportunities. Lastly, feel free to follow me on Instagram at thewanderinginvestor. I look forward to hearing from you.